From Connecticut Public Radio in New Haven, this is Seasoned. I'm Chef Plum. And I'm Leanne Griffin, food reporter at Hearst Connecticut Media, and I'm the co-host this month. So I've been wanting to do an episode celebrating restaurants that have stood the test of time in our state for years, and it's finally come together. Chef Plum and I visited three local gems, and we talked with the families behind them. And I have to say, as a journalist who has a sad job of publishing a year-end list of restaurants that have closed in 2022, it really gives me great joy to shine a light on the restaurants that have been serving you for decades, and they're still going strong. Ahead, we'll take you to, of course, the Griswold Inn in Essex. It's been around for 247 years. That's a real number. We also hung out at the Shish Kebab House of Afghanistan in West Hartford, now in its 35th year, and the Glenwood Drive-In in Hamden, now approaching 70 years. But if staying in and cooking is more your thing, stick around for our conversation with cookbook author John Cannell. Millions of fans know him from his Preppy Kitchen blog, and he lives right here in Connecticut. He's going to give us some baking tips, because you know, I write about food for a living, but I'm really not the best baker in the world. Before we share our visits to these restaurants and talk to these families, Leanne, for the people who haven't seen your work in one of the Hearst papers or online, can you talk about your experience covering the food beat here in Connecticut? Sure. I have been with Hearst Connecticut now for two years exactly, and I write about food for all of the publications, including the Connecticut Post, the New Haven Register, the Connecticut Magazine, the papers in Stanford and Greenwich, and the CT Insider site, which is our now statewide coverage hub. Yeah. Yeah, I've been working in food for about a dozen years now, I would say. I started in, in Hartford at The Current, and now I have been covering the majority of the state for the last two years where I was kind of concentrated in Hartford previously. So I've gotten to learn a lot about all the wonderful gems that we do have around here. Yeah, there's some great food gems in the state. That's one of the things we love the most about this show is being able to find them. What's one of your favorite things about your job? You know, everyone's going to say the food. Yeah. But <laughs> and the food is great, but I really enjoy learning the backstory behind right. these entrepreneurs. And it's kind of incredible what some of them have been through, especially with COVID. But yeah, for sure. Just learning how they got here and what they've been through and, you know, how it's transform their lives. It's really kind of incredible. Yeah, the food, the stories. This is why we love these places for sure. And I couldn't think of a better companion to come along with me to explore the family spirit and community support behind restaurants that have served guests for decades. So thanks for coming. Thank you. So up first, Plum and I want to take you on a tour of the Griswold Inn in Essex. We're guided by Joan Paul. She's co-owned the inn, affectionately called the Grizz, along with her husband and brother since 1995. Welcome to the Griswold Inn. Since 1776, we've been open. Our doors have opened to offer fine foods, spirits, and lodging since 1776, and we've never been closed in 246 years. The Grizz is made up of historic dining areas, a newer wine room, and at the heart of it all, a tap room. We start there. The tap room embodies the spirit of the 1700s. It has dark wood walls, ship's portraits, and maritime art everywhere you look a grand stone fireplace, and of course, a well-stocked bar. The soul of the Griswold Inn right here, and this is our famous tap room. This is actually the first schoolhouse in Essex. It was built in 1738, and it was actually moved here back in the day by a team of oxen on rolling logs. This is the original ceiling. It's never been painted, touched. You know, there's a, a patch here or there, but this is from years and years of, you see we have a wood-burning Fireplace. So years and years of fireplace smoke, I guess. And back in the day, cigars when, when yeah. smoking was allowed in here. So it's very so dark. So it's got this rich warm. patina. Yeah. And yeah, you just feel really enveloped by the atmosphere. A few steps to the left, we walk into what's called the gun room. This space is more intimate and steeped in history. The walls of this dining room are lined with dozens of historic guns, giving it a unique rustic feel. You know, you see on both walls that we have a collection of firearms, some dating back to the 13th century. And my absolute favorite piece of history in the entire inn, and you can see history is at every turn, right? But my absolute fi favorite piece is a note that was found in the barrel of this musket, a Revolutionary War musket. And it's very hard to see, but I will tell you what it says. Yeah, please. 7th day July, 1776, from a father to his son, it says, My dear son Jared, take this my gun, do not handle it in fun, but with it join ye ranks of Washington, and make ye British run. And when our independence is won, we shall take a drink of good old rum. So, three days after yeah. the country isn't, isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. 
And just again, a father to his son. Finally, we walk toward the newest addition of the Grizz, the wine bar. You still feel that historic vibe, but it's combined here with a modern dining experience. A little bit of old with the new. We wanted to offer a different culinary experience to people. It's almost like a separate restaurant. Is the menu different here than? Completely different. Wow. Yeah, we do the classics over there and over here. We have small plates and macro plates and over 50 wines by the glass. It's interesting. There's history again, as I will say, at every turn here. I didn't point out all the banners from the women's temperance movement, which we had on all of the walls. There's four or five of them. And, you know, back in the day, since many of the men and boys here went out to sea, that was how they earned their living. Right. You know, the women were here to hold down the fort. But when their husbands came back at the foot of Main Street and got their paycheck, they would come up the street and land right in the tavern here and drink a lot of it away. And so those women used to march on Main Street. There was a whole movement. And, and they had the banners, these big banners marching up and down. And one of them says... Um, there's a picture of wheat and grapes. If you eat us, we're food. If you drink us, we're poison. And that is one of the um, one of the banners we have in there. That would have been like in the 1840s, 1850s. Okay. Yeah. Now that we've toured the unique dining spaces, Leanne and I sit down with Joan to learn more about the Griswold Inn. While lots of local restaurants in our state have stood the test of time, few of those restaurants are truly historic. The Griswold Inn opened its doors for business in June, really, of 1776. Wow. And we have been open then, if you do the math, for 246 years, going on 247 in short order. And we have never closed our doors in all of that period of time. War, recession, depression, prohibition. We were a speakeasy during then. Yankee ingenuity yet again. (laughs) Yeah. Like you said, that nearly 247 years of history and so... Is it even possible to talk about some of the notable moments that they've had since the 1770s up to the time that your family has owned it? We have been through a lot of significant historical events here. And um, I say war, and what I mean by that is during the War of 1812, there was actually a British raid on Essex in 1814. And the troops, you know, rode in um, by cloak of darkness and then rode into Essex, the foot of Main Street, marched up here. Um, And at one point commandeered the inn for a period of, you know, 24 hours or less or something. And yet here we are still to tell the tale. And actually our hunt breakfast, which we were famous for for many, many years, started because of that British raid. So we have, you know, the war. Uh, We have, again, recession, the depression. And that, of course, a lot of places went out of business during that. And we were able to, you know, make it through that. And um, prohibition was probably one of the hardest things that the Grizzled Inn faced. And it was a speakeasy during then. There was rum running going on at the end of the street and, you know, the knock on the back door and all of that that one might imagine. We've heard stories about that particular period of time from there. And now you have a wine bar. I know it. I know. So I, I feel like it's Yankee ingenuity. I say that again and again that has kept the doors open through all of those historical events. History is cool. Yes. Like, history is super cool. But what about your history, like your personal connections here? Of all of the employees, and we have some longstanding employees, but I am probably the one that first entered this picture when I was, um, I don't know, 15 years old. And I was a, a breakfast waitress, a bus girl, ultimately a dining room waitress, a cocktail waitress. And this was just every summer through high school and college. Um, And then, you know, I went off and went to Washington, D.C. and did other things. And who knew I was ever coming back years later? I think the math was something like 22 years later. But the Paul family, of which I am one because I am married to a Paul, um, we own and operate the Grizz. And as I said, we've done it for about 27 years. I mean, you can just see the love in her, can't you, Leanne? Like how much she loves this place. You can see it. You can can feel it. Well, that's great. I mean, it's a special spot. I I wouldn't want to do what I'm doing now for any old place. And I put that in quotes because, listen, I love going to other restaurants and there's fabulous places, you know, all over. And I've experienced a lot of them and I love it. But the Griswold Inn, there's something really soulful about it. Yeah. And I think that we really feel that it matters to people that have their family traditions here and that they they tell us how much it matters to them. And whether it's been a momentous occasion they've had at the table by the, you know, fireplace in the library that we saw. Many people have said, you know, I really sort of started my business over cocktails at the 
bar and you know in the yeah. tap room but i would also say we really celebrate everyday life yeah mm -hmm. and so you walk through the doors and you typically i hope feel like you know you're welcome and you're really greeted warmly and you belong here to have that experience so i figured yeah. it out i figured it out what's it Joan doesn't want to own any old place. No. She just wants to own a really old place. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there you go. Dad joke. Sorry. What do you think about when you imagine this place lasting another hundred years? And how do you hope you'll get there? Quite honestly, I think we were attracted to it in the beginning is we all love history. And we all love that sort of sense of place that the Griswold Inn offers and offers to the community and people sort of far and wide, really. Now it's got a reputation that far goes beyond, you know, Connecticut, right? What we want to do is to be able to continue to offer this experience, even after my husband, my brother-in-law, me, you know, all of that, even after we are gone, somehow figure out how it can continue, to continue to be able to expand on what's already here. And I say that piece because while we haven't touched really much of what is in the historic dining rooms. We've only added some old, um, you know, art that we found at auction or whatever. We have converted the old dining room into a wine bar and different culinary experience. But we feel, of course, um, that we've done it really carefully and that it, there's continuity between the old and what we've added here. And really what that is, first of all, is um, the expression of maritime art throughout, mm -hmm. just displayed in a little different way. We walk a fine line. This is the tough thing that I'm not sure everybody always understands this about operating a place like this, where you want to preserve the history and the uniqueness of that. You don't get that in a lot of places, right? The authenticity of what this place is. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, people want a different kind of service or experience in some ways. They want to be part of this authentic tradition, and yet they have different culinary tastes and all of that kind of thing. So this show is about food. So of course, I want to talk about food a little bit here. Of course. I mean, uh, and I have to ask, with being open for 240 years plus. 46. 246 <laughs> years. The menu's probably changed more than double that, I got to imagine. Is there like a quintessential Grizz dish or like something that just stands the test of time consistently? We have three dining outlets, I would call it, under one roof, as you sort of saw through the tour. But we have historic dining which features really uh, classic New England dishes, both, um, you know, land and sea, let's call that. And then we have our tap room, which features a tavern fare menu, burgers and salads and sandwiches and that type of thing. And then, of course, as we just discussed, the wine bar. We mm -hmm. have the wine bar, which is a more contemporary, if you will, culinary concept with small plates and over 50 wines by the glass and macro plates. and All out of the same kitchen, right? We have a very large kitchen, so it's all out of the same kitchen, but it's a very large kitchen. Okay. So it is segmented in some ways. The wine bar, for instance, has a completely dedicated chef okay. um, for the wine bar, and that is sort of a separate area. But yes, we have one executive chef, and he rules the roost back there. Yeah. And he's been with us for probably, I don't know, maybe eight, ten years. Wow. This relates to the food concept and the question that you asked me, because his name is Chef Toppin, Chef Shahid Toppin. His father, Kenny Toppin, was the executive chef during my era back in no the way. 70s when wow. I was here, when I was 15 years wow. old. And That's his father crazy. was here. What a great story that is, yeah. you know, to come back to where you kind of started and you worked with your family and you come back and now you're running the show. Talk about the menus themselves a little bit. They are classic dishes. We've had a signature roasted prime rib on the menu probably for 60 years. Wow. Classic preparation and just this big, beautiful hunk of meat on your plate. With a little right? bit of jus on yes, there. Yes, just... a little horseradish on yeah. the side. But that is really a classic. There's always a nod, I suppose, still to the fact that we're in New England Perhaps. and, you know, the, the fresh seafood and all of that. It's seasonal ingredients when you know, they're available. And we do take advantage of the, of course, ingredients that we need to bring in on the other side, on this side to the wine bar, they're just prepared in a, again, I put this in quotes, a more sort of contemporary mm -hmm. uh, preparation that mm -hmm. might be there. They're maybe lighter and they are certainly smaller because the other side, we've always been known for sure. really generous portions of the food. The Grizz is really literally the center of town here. It's called an anchor of Essex. Can you talk about what this place means to the community? 
obviously this has been here, as I will say it again, you know, for over two centuries, right? And so you will see when you walk up and down Main Street, there are really well-preserved sea captains' homes. And, you know, you don't see, there's Talbots at the top of the street, but other than that, you don't yeah. see those kinds of, you know, there's no big box stores and there's no chain stores or whatever. And why am I bringing that? Because there's a lot of small galleries and boutiques and such. And they are, I have to say, they are can be in business because the Griswold Inn is the draw and because we have been here for all of that period of time and haven't closed our doors. So even when financial times are tough out there and tough for us as well, we still are the draw that brings people here. Honestly, everybody who comes through our doors is important, right? Because whether they're coming on a Saturday night and they're dressed up and using, you know, going out for a special dinner and it's a hard earned paycheck and they're having that special experience or, um, you know, they're coming in, bellying up at the bar and, and, and having a beer or whatever. It's important to everybody to spend their time here, to spend some part of their time. We appreciate that. Their money their time. You talked about engagements by your fireplace. You talked about people making big business decisions. You know, you'd be probably so much more that happened here in people's lives that you might even not even know. Here's an interesting story. Frederick Law Olmsted, who's a famous landscape architect and actually designed, okay, the biggest thing is Central Park in New York. It's said that he actually was in the gun room with somebody and we used to have paper placemats back in the day and, you know, sort of sketched his general idea Whoa. Yeah, on the back of a um, placemat. You know, just here. So there's just, you have no idea about how many things would have happened here. Well, if you want to get a sense of the type of community, one type of community here at the Grizz, I'm told Monday nights are uh, in the tap room or is a really, really good time. <laughs> this might be the only place actually in the entire state where you can hear a live sea shanty and you can hear the music and see it performed. Um, tell us a little bit about that because it's been going on a long time. Okay. That is the night. Okay. And Sea Shanties has been on Monday night, and that continues, that tradition, for the last 50 years. They have banjos, and they have mandolins, and they have all manner of um, instruments that fantastic. they play. And it's just a really strong like camaraderie among those people that may only see each other even that Monday night. Yeah. It's funny to see maybe somebody who is staying at the inn and just happens upon that. <laughs> whole event <laughs> they're like on? what What's is going here? on however if you stay to the end they have this wonderful tradition where they all talk about basically that the concept is you know nobody's a stranger they're just friends not yet met and after you have that experience together on a monday night whether you were a stranger walking in you're all friends and welcome I anytime this, I, I absolutely love this we need to come back i'm <laughs> yes <laughs> you Are must you though me? I say everybody, no matter what, you're like, see, Shanties, I don't think that's my thing. When you are in the middle of that room and they are belting out those tunes and everyone knows the chorus and everyone is joining in, it, this, there is just really this wonderful sense of fellowship and camaraderie. And it's all for me, grog, me jolly, jolly grog, all young for beer and tobacco. We were speaking with Joan Paul, the co-owner, along with her husband and his brothers, of the historic Griswold Inn of Essex, and that sea shanty music was provided by Cliff Haslam. You'll find him, along with the band The Jovial Crew, at The Grits every Monday night. It may be me. That sounds fun. I'm Leanne Griffin. And I'm Chef Plum. This is Seasoned. We'll be right back after a quick break. You're listening to Seasoned. I'm Chef Plum. And I'm Leanne Griffin. Plum and I are talking with the families behind a few local restaurants that have stood the test of time. Next, we want you to meet Aaron and Angela Sarwar. They are the brother and sister team running the Shish Kebab House of Afghanistan and West Hartford. Aaron and Angela, welcome to Seasoned, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you for being here. We're super excited to be part of this. 
So Aaron, your family opened this restaurant originally in the late 1980s? That's correct. They opened in 1988. So they actually initially opened a uh, fast food restaurant in Hartford. Did that for about a year and they were just really yearning to open a a full service, like sit down family restaurant because of my grandmother. That was, those were her wishes. So they sold the fast food restaurant, which was called Chicken Delight. Some of the viewers may remember it as uh, the place that had the radio commercials. Don't cook tonight called Chicken Delight. That was uh, <laughs> to my fa- that's, yeah, that's what my family had in, uh, on uh, Albany Ave in Hartford. Okay. So they sold uh, uh, the fast food restaurant, put their money together, and opened up Shish Kebab House on Franklin Ave. It was 360 Franklin Ave, just diagonal from, uh, from the original Mazzucato's. I basically grew up there, very uh, vivid memories. You know, my sister Angela here basically doing our homework there. And I mean, it's just, it's been, yeah, it's all history. <laughs> yeah. I think my grandfather just saw we we're in Little Italy and Franklin Avenue and all these Italian restaurants that were thriving at the time. And he was like, just had the vision. You know, he took that big risk. And my mom is just like him. She's the big risk taker in the family, which she decided to make that big move and step up to West Harvard Center. And thankfully, here we are 30 years later, still thriving. Well, first of all, walking in here, it's so fun. It's so, it just feels like something's about to happen, like we're about to have a big party. It feels so festive. And I love that with the the beautiful carpets hanging and the wine bottles that are on the shelves recessed into the walls and the purple curtains, I guess. Yeah, a little dividing wall back there. Yeah, it just seems really, really fun. So for both of you guys, what was it like growing up in the restaurant? Because it seems like it was really fun. Yeah, we had a great time growing up. It was It really made me what I am today. All my friends worked with us throughout high school, college. We had so many memories here. We made so much new family. It's like amazing here, people say, as soon as they walk in with all the different levels and the dining, the bar area, the hookah lounge on the second floor. There's like a lot to do, completely different scenes in every single area. But yeah, it's good times. So you've got some, your family's got some serious roots here. So who are we talking about? Who first started everything? Who first moved here? Uh, well, my entire family, uh, me and Angela were, were born, were actually born here in, in Hartford. But my grandparents, uncles, my mother, my father, all of them actually moved to the United States from Afghanistan in the 80s. It's actually kind of a, quite a story. My mother's side of family, which is a side that started the restaurant, was very involved in the old regime in Afghanistan. So when the country became communist in 1978, my grandfather being an anti-communist, him and his friends actually started working against the Communist Party, which led to his arrest. Uh, They actually showed up at the house and arrested my grandfather, all my uncles, you know, for a short period of time until there was a period of reconciliation, at which point they released all the political prisoners. And that's when my grandfather had seen the writing on the wall. So he, he basically told everyone, pack your bags, we are out of here. And they... They left Afghanistan in a hurry as if they were going on a vacation because yeah. they wouldn't let them sell their property or they were under the microscope mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. being who they were. You would always talk about like his Mustang and his mm-hmm. V-Dub. He left all that behind, went right, right to New Delhi, India. Right. And that's where my father comes into play. My dad had ended up in New Delhi because he was actually uh, running away from the draft in Afghanistan. He knew a guy that knew a guy who uh, sold uh, counterfeit visas. Right, okay. So so my mother's family wanted to come to America and bumped into my father, who hooked them up with the counterfeit visas. So he kind of hitched a ride along with them. Uh, so they were here uh, undocumented or illegal immigrants, whatever you want to call them. You know, they just started working towards the American dream. The attorney that actually stepped in and, and uh, helped them pro bono to get the uh, asylum status or political political asylum, still comes to the restaurant to this day with his family. Wow. Oh, wow. My grandmother and grandfather were originally the ones that pushed for the restaurant. Had they had restaurant experience? The reason my grandmother pushed for a restaurant is that's what she was really good at. She was really good at cooking. Okay. When they were in Afghanistan, they'd have big get-togethers at the house, and she would cook. She would cook up a storm. That's where that's where it comes from. My uncle took over after my grandfather passed away, of course, and then my mother took over the restaurant and moved it to West Harvard Center, and it is what it is today. That's the family history of it. So restaurants survive because their communities really rally around them. What's been your experience in the communities of Hartford and now West Hartford? And what was it like in the early days? 
Oh, in Hartford, it was awesome. Franklin Ave was definitely a little Italy. They had the uh, Italian festivals. I don't know if you guys had, had gone to those, but they were great. They would close the street down. We would actually get a table out there, put a grill out there, and uh, we'd be swapping kebabs for for meatballs and, and <laughs> pasta. We would close up at our restaurant and see like all our customers' cars were still in a parking lot. We're like, where are they? Like, how? Wh- where do they all go? You go go to Mazzucato's and they're all in there, you know, enjoying gelato and, and lattes and everything. It was it was quite the neighborhood. Yeah. They just, they basically uh, took us right into the community. Yeah, they really embraced you. Yeah. We have a lot of regular customers from Franklin Ave that come here, like, on a weekly basis. So we're really thankful for that. All the way from Franklin Ave. And they remember us running around being little children. They're like, oh, my God, now we see you. They see our little children running around now, too. So it's really <laughs> nice to still have that support from them. Yeah. Biggest thing that comes to mind for me in terms of the community rallying around us uh, would be 9-11. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a very scary time for us. It's always like, where were you on 9-11? Well, I remember where we were, and uh, we were kind of a receiving end of people just trying to vent their anger. It was kind of traumatic. I mean, within within hours, our just our lives completely changed. I was in high school when it happened, and then I remember having to leave my classroom. My teacher actually told me to go sit in the teacher's lounge for my own safety, but initially we were just empty. I mean, people were egging the restaurant, we were getting phone calls and threats, and um, Asylum Hill Congregational actually came out in force. They had this big dinner event at the restaurant, basically filled the entire restaurant, and they did it regularly, and they... uh, you know, the news got out. It was it was awesome. The community really came out. It was it was beautiful to see. We did have a, a lot of support though as well from all our regular customers. They were there calling us and sending us mail, like definitely supporting us. We're definitely a part of the community, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's wonderful. So having a strong family spirit, a great family backbone to any restaurant can help it have long staying power. But the food's got to be delicious to keep customers coming back. It just has to be. For listeners who are new to Afghan cuisine, can you describe its signature characteristics? So Afghanistan is split in half by the Silk Road. So we have both Eastern and Western influences, um, you know, West within its neighborhood. So you have uh, Persian influences, Indian influences. You got the Asian influence. It's a real unique mix. You know, we have we have our dumpling dishes like the Mantu and Ashak. Big with lamb, which is a, definitely a signature of that region, and then uh, big with basmati rice. Uh, and for rice se- plays a big role. Oh, a huge role! It's not, meals never complete without rice, is the saying in, a, in our home. At least it isn't for me. Even yeah. Thanksgiving, I, I do the turkey, but I need to have rice. My mom always does a little rice rice for me. So, but the big seasonings are uh, cumin, coriander, cardamom. That's it in a nutshell. I've always thought about the rice in this cuisine, kind of equating it to like sushi rice, like how how important it is to the cuisine itself. Is is that a little off base or? I like that actually. That's a real. That's that's kind of a nice pasta to it. The Italian. Yeah. It's like yeah. we literally people. Most people will take rice and just like it's that one kind. Whereas us, yeah, yeah. if we take so much time and preparation just to make our rice, and we have so many different types of rices that we make, and it's like a long process just to. We boil it, throw it in the oven, you bake it. We put a lot of time and effort into our rice making. We have palau rice, which contains raisins, almonds, carrots. We have our spinach rice, which is also a staple here. We have my mom who comes in all the time and, like, obviously makes sure everything is still quality control. You know, she's judgy about the rice. Yeah, like, if something's a little bit off, you know, my dad or someone will, like, let them know. Mm-hmm. And I Sounds throw like a lot there. to live it's, up it's to. My mother's restaurant. That's something that people always forget. It's my mother's restaurant. If you ask my dad, like, people always, I don't know, for whatever reason, always like look towards my dad thinking it's his restaurant. But my mom, you know, they always make sure to correct them. Correct it's like, <laughs> no, it's, my, it's her restaurant. It's my mother's restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> my dad just comes here to enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> She's the boss. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Angela, you're the one that curated this menu. Are there dishes that your grandmother would have made or did make and are there ones that really represent your family and this cultural heritage? Oh, yeah, definitely. I feel like the staples that my grandmother helped to create was the cobbly rice, the pumpkin, which is one of the most popular dishes here. She's the one who put that together and people come till this day every Thanksgiving to get that dish for their Thanksgiving dinner every single year. 
most important is the eggplant and the pumpkin dishes that my grandmother helped to create. Those will never, ever go away. Can you tell us about this pumpkin? Because Aaron just reacted strongly oh, to yeah, how much pumpkin, he loves it. Yeah, I would say the vast majority of people love it. And then they get completely obsessed with it. We have people that come in, they'll sit at the bar and just get like a side of pumpkin. And I'm like, you know, you need to have the rice with that. But they, they're like, no, I want this pumpkin alone. <laughs> it's, uh, it's It's got like a little bit of a spice, but it's, it's got a sweetness to it. It's good. But in my opinion, you have to have it with lamb and rice. No, is it like so, a stewed pumpkin, like a puree? It's or? a puree. Okay. Mm-hmm. I know I had it. I just couldn't remember. It's a pureed <laughs> pumpkin, yeah. 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 Why do I always have to sit around when people talk about food and not yeah. have any food? Yeah, we're going to have some food <laughs> soon. Worst thing ever. And then the Montu, I have to add the Montu. The Montu is a, a big staple. It actually won, if anybody remembers the Taste of Hartford, I remember yeah. I remember this moment vividly. We tied with another restaurant. We got second place because of a coin toss. But that was for, for, but it was <laughs> the, Mon, the Montu. Um, the Montu is phenomenal. They're, uh, it's very similar to Monte, which is Turkish. Okay. Uh, we have a lot more Asian influence, so our mantu is actually bigger. They're, they're, they're bigger dumplings. They're dumplings built ground beef, onion, coriander, top of split peas, and homemade yogurt, yeah. and they are phenomenal. The, the food is very specific to Kabul, Afghanistan. So my family's from the capital city, uh, so the food is as you would get it in Kabul, Afghanistan. We know our ethnic group even. like We're Kabuli Tajik, so like our food isn't as spicy. You'll find it to be very mild. If you want it spicy, just let us know, and we'll make it spicy. Um, we understand that people in the Afghan community sometimes come to the restaurant not to eat like initially, but to talk to you because you've earned a reputation in the community as a resource. What does it mean for you to be able to help Afghan immigrants find their footing in a new place? Just knowing that we're kind of like the safe haven for them. Honestly, like every week I see countless Afghans coming in here just to kind of get in our community and meet um, their fellow Afghans. So it's really nice that they see us, you know, kind of as that community place to feel like they're at home. We'll just sit down and just talk. Yeah. Um, they'll tell us about, you know, things they're having difficulty with or help them make phone calls or just how things work. Just, you know, mm-hmm. it's such a, it's a culture shock coming here. So that must yeah. be really comforting Teaching about the parking. Cause yeah. the parking is very, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've given up with that. I still the parking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, yeah, we definitely try to do as much as we can for the community. It's definitely grown. I would say it's at least doubled, if not tripled, with all the Afghan refugees that have come over. So, Aaron and Angela, thank you so much for all of your time here. We really enjoyed learning thank about you your family and, and this and this restaurant that is 35 years strong at this point. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for uh, for having us. Really appreciate it. I always love talking about the, the history and the restaurant. It's it's a lot of fun. So thank you for uh, for having us. I appreciate cannot you. wait to come back thank here. You. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That was Aaron and Angela Sarwar of the Shish Kebab House of Afghanistan in West Hartford. And a couple of fun elements that add to the restaurant's vibe. Adults can experience the fruity aromas perfuming the second floor hookah lounge where flavored tobacco is smoked, somehow with a traditional hookah pipe and an orange. We didn't get to try it. There's also a speakeasy situation through the back door in the alleyway that leads down to a bar and game room Aaron calls the bunker. It's kind of a pet project of his and a refuge for area restaurant workers. The final local spot we want to shine a light on is the Glenwood Drive-In. It started as a hot dog stand in Hamden 68 years ago. Wow. Wayne Stone is a second-generation owner of Glenwood, and his grown children run it now. We spoke with Wayne and his daughter, Kelly Saccone. You might know Kelly from Kelly's Cone Connection. She started the ice cream shop attached to the restaurant in 1985, so she knows a little something about serving customers for decades, too. Wayne, let's start with you. You're the second-generation owner of Glenwood, and you've been in charge since 1960. That is correct. Wow. Some restaurants are are constantly changing, Wayne, but you attribute the Glenwood's longevity partly to the fact that you haven't changed over the years at all. Talk about the keep it simple approach, Hummel Brothers hot dogs, burgers, onion rings, lobster rolls, ice cream from Kelly's shop. It's classic food from a classic drive-in. Well, basically, everything with us is we're fresh food and it's cooked to order. You know, it's reasonable prices. It's good service and friendly atmosphere. We're only closed three days a year. We close Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter. And believe it or not, we do get some customers who ask us if we would be open on either Christmas Eve or on Easter. And we do ship food out to customers out of state. They want whole clams or they want soft shell crabs or they want stuff. We try to accommodate them if we can. Talk about those Hummel hot dogs for me just a little bit. What a delicious hot dog. Well, Hummel's hot dogs are what we've been using, probably been using Hummel's hot dogs for 50 years. Great quality and they're great to work with. Eric Hummel, 
who works on the radio and auctions, does a great job great for guy. us. And we're very happy to have that association. With and locally made. And locally made. So Hummel is another business where there's second and third generation family in that business like yourselves. Yes. Yeah. So Kelly, Glenwood's been in your family for almost 70 years. When you're not here, you are right next door at the ice cream shop, Kelly's Cone Connection. Can you tell us about how you learned how to make ice cream? Were you inspired by this restaurant background? How did this all come together, the ice cream shop? Well, I worked at the Glenwood, and we wanted to go into some kind of dessert or something because we had nothing to offer our customers. So we decided to do homemade ice cream. And I went to an ice cream university. It's like a, um, <laughs> it's a very quick program. And I learned to make ice cream. And then throughout the years, I still attend conventions. I was on the board of the New England Ice Cream Association and the National Ice Cream Association. I keep in touch with a lot of people, and we just share a lot of ideas. Most of the people you find in the ice cream industry are very nice and helpful. Making ice cream is fairly simple process. Whatever you put into the ice cream comes out of the ice cream. And I always follow the same philosophy that my father taught me. Quality is better. So we always use the finest ingredients that we can get to make the best ice cream. We do work with a local farm, Hinnager's Farm in Hamden. And when they produce their fresh berries, strawberries, blueberries, and peaches. We work with them, and we make our ice cream with their products that are grown right here in Hamden. This is making me so happy. Yeah, yeah. It's making me so, <laughs> so Yeah, happy. so we've, we've um, hooked up with a lot of local businesses and done things like that. So as dad and as the owner of this restaurant for years, I mean, how has it been for you to see her evolve like this and to create this whole other section of the business? Well, it's been very rewarding to see it pick up and see what it's done and take it over and see how hard she works. I also have my other daughter that runs the, runs the Glenwood, and she works. But they're two completely opposite operations. Kelly has to come in and make everything from scratch and do everything. And if she's not here doing it herself, she supervises it. Uh, so it's very rewarding to see the kids. And it's great for me to be in, in my age group and be able to come in every day and I get to see my children work and prosper and do the things. So it's very rewarding. It makes me very proud. Kelly, what do you attribute the success for being around for so long and, and being such a staple? We have food that makes people feel good. Like I think in the past three years, too, it's like a comfort thing. It's the same thing they've had forever, you know, and it just makes them feel good. And that's why they keep coming back. Yeah, food can trigger a lot of emotions. That's for sure. Yeah, our grill we've used for years. It's seasoned. Like you could buy our hot dogs and bring them home, but I still don't think they have that same taste yeah. as the Glenwood because our grill is, it's really seasoned and it's it's served Thousands. I wonder how many hot dogs. Yeah. It'd be interesting to do the math. If this girl could talk. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What is it like working with family and dynamics? And how for does a it... long time working yeah. with family. We're not talking like working with family for a year. Yeah. Right. It seems like it's been successful. It has been successful. And it, it's not easy. But um, I think we all respect each other. And everybody does work hard. Like, I find it really special. Like, my nephew, Mitchell. He is 28 years old now, but when he was little, he was here every single day. We had a playpen in the back. Oh, my son, too. He came here every day when he was a kid. So I got to have a special relationship with my nephew that I wouldn't have had if I was in a different business. And then, too, like, my aunt comes and my uncle comes, and they come and they see us here, and it's just, it's, it's a special place. Yeah. It really is. And Wayne, how about you? What do you think about working with family? Well, I think working with family is extremely hard. But we're fortunate it works for us. When one isn't able to do something, the other one can step in and do everything. So it's very rewarding to see them grow up and come along and stuff. There are trying times when they don't agree with each other and each one wants to go a separate way. But I think it's very uh, comfortable to, for myself to come in and see the operation that it's continuing and doing so well under the tiring circumstances and stuff that we have. What are some of your earliest memories here when you were coming here as a child? Was there something that you loved to eat? Were there, you know, specific memories that you kind of hold dear about Glenwood? I always remember coming here and getting lunch, and the hot dog was always my favorite, and I like my hot dogs with just mustard on them. Mm-hmm. And I remember the Glenwood in three or four different phases because we've added all these additions on. 
The first one, it was just a tiny little hot dog stand. And then we added on the dining room to accommodate more people to sit down and be able to eat. And then in 1985, we added the ice cream parlor. And Wayne? Early memories are are odd. I was so young. Uh, My dad passed away at 38. And I came in and took it over uh, right in 1960. Well, when we first originally started, it was taken over. It used to be a dairy aisle, like a dairy queen. And they just had the two outside windows. And then what we did is our first addition was little outside jealousy, aluminum screens and doors and stuff with picnic tables. And then to see it grow to what it is today, to where we seat so many people and have so many, it's, it, it, it's pride and proud to be established with it and see how they've kept it up and what they've done and stuff. So it's very rewarding for me. And my biggest memories, we hosted the Stanley Cup here for a day. You did. I can't even remember the name of the player who bought it to us. <laughs> it was the manager of the team. Everyone on the team gets to have the cup for a couple days. Oh, okay. And he bought it around all Hamden. We are a very big hockey community, and he bought it to all different businesses. And he had worked here, and his brother had worked here, and he bought it so that we could um, show all our customers. That's really fun. Yeah, I believe that was probably sometime in the 90s. Yeah, that was fun. That's very cool. Yeah, Yeah, because I I remember putting my nephew in the bowl. (laughs) Yeah, it's big. I would say he was about three years old. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. That's pretty fun right there. You know, I have one customer that told me he wants to host his funeral here. He wants to prepay, (laughs) and then after uh, his funeral, that he's going to treat everybody to hot dogs and onion rings at the Glenwood. That's actually so, kind of sweet. That's perfect right that's there. Great. That's yes. Right there. That we have people that, like, the first place they come back into town, it's the Glenwood to get their hot dogs. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It makes you feel good. People tell us some really good stories. It's an integral part of the community. I love yes. It. We have generations of regulars. And we have generations. We do. Yeah. And me, personally, I see three generations. That's amazing. So great. that's how long I've been here. <laughs> That was Wayne Stone, owner of the Glenwood Drive-In in Hamden, and his daughter, Kelly Saccone. You can find them both at the restaurant or at Kelly's Cone Connection, where they make a delicious-looking chocolate peanut butter ice cream pie. I'm Leanne Griffin. And I'm Chef Blum. This is Seasoned, and we'll be right back after a quick break. This is Seasoned. I'm Chef Plum. And I'm Leanne Griffin. We began this episode shining a light on local restaurants we wanted you to know about. And now we've got something for those of you who'd rather stay in and cook. John Cannell has been cheering on home cooks since he started his blog, The Preppy Kitchen, in 2015. He's a former math and science teacher, so you might not be surprised to learn that he's an expert baker. John joined us on Zoom from his farm in Litchfield County, where we got to know him a bit and get some baking tips from his book, Preppy Kitchen, Recipes for Seasonal Dishes and Simple Pleasures. John Cannell, welcome to Season. We're happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have a fun conversation about food. We want to talk about your style of cooking and recipes in the book Preppy Kitchen, especially recipes in your winter chapter. But before we get to that, you say in the book's introduction that you're living a seemingly unlikely Norman Rockwell kind of life with your husband on a goat farm, your twin boys. Can you help our listeners get to know you just a little bit? And what's your background? And how did you land in Connecticut raising a flock of chickens and Nigerian dwarf goats? Because I love goats. Yeah. So goats are the cutest. And here's the deal. My husband and I were both Los Angeles natives. So I would categorize us as like city people. And we had a nice life in Los Angeles. But when we had our twins, Lachlan and George, you know, you live your life and you're like, well, this is what I want, but that's going to be X number of years away, or this is going to be something I'm going to work for to happen in the future. And we had these two little boys who were two years old at the time, they're twins. And like, oh my gosh, every moment is just slipping through our fingers. And some things that we wanted for tomorrow, I think we want for today. And part of that was living a slower life, having more of a connection to food and the land and the rhythm of nature. And for us, that meant picking up sticks and moving to Connecticut. So <laughs> we really just took a leap of faith and created a new life for ourselves. Well, John, I got to tell you, I have twins as well. 
And, oh, you do? Uh, yeah, and I have a rule in my house now. I don't want anything else living in our house. Like if it, <laughs> like, so I don't know how you're raising goats and chickens and all that at the same time as raising twins. <laughs> well, you know, it's a labor of love, but they really keep you busy. And you just recalibrate what busy means. Like before kids busy is very different from after kids busy. <laughs> so... Why Connecticut? Did you spin the globe like and come into America and just go, Connecticut? <laughs> oh my gosh, that'd be hilarious. No, it's a beautiful place to live. A lot of people just don't understand that Connecticut has the full breadth of the seasons. So like fall is like stunning. The land is just going to sleep. Things are slowing down. You're appreciating everything that happens so far in the year and gathering your harvest. There's like a, a bounty and like a sense of wonder just from the natural beauty. And winter, although everyone loves to complain about it, is like so stunning like all the little towns here including mine will decorate their greens and have christmas lights up there's a christmas tree um, lighting ceremony and you're just getting cozy and you have a white christmas which is so rare like i'm from los angeles and it would often be like 82 degrees it kind of makes it hard to get into the christmas spirit and put a sweater on <laughs> so you're just like <laughs> you're like i should be in swim trunks right now um we love that part and also, the kids have so much more land. They have room to play in. They understand that we have like we have beehives, and they love the honey from our bees. And they know that our bees are helping that our, our flowers. And we have wild wildflower fields that kind of help support nature and the bees. And they get all these connections firsthand. Like there's nothing cuter than seeing Lachlan and George harvest vegetables from our garden. And then like if my mom's visiting, like they'll make Nana's vegetable soup with things from the garden. Like she'll chop it together. There's like such a sense of pride and understanding that comes from those moments. And that's really what well, that's the impetus was to move here. What a beautiful picture you just painted there. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, make me want to live there. And I do live here. So <laughs> come on over. <laughs> yeah, you really have painted a beautiful picture. And we want to say we're glad you chose Connecticut because it's nice to hear how people from other parts of the country view the state we love so much. So you know, we're talking about your twins. And I know that before you had them, you were a middle school math and science teacher, which were never my topics of <laughs> great excellence. <laughs> I was a writer, obviously. Um, but I've, I've always thought that learning more about the science and the precision behind cooking would have been cool. So did your passion for cooking revolve around that? Did that play into it? You know, my mom is from Mexico and um, she's specifically from a really small village in Mexico called Via Purificación. She grew up making everything from scratch with fresh ingredients. And when she came to this country, she brought with her a love of fresh ingredients and cooking with love. And she's also a very curious person. So when she came to Los Angeles, there's, it's such a melting pot of cultures. She really like just dove in and like learned about like Swedish baking and French cooking and everything else and melded that together. So there was a constant sense of experimentation and of giving, giving from the kitchen. And I was her helper all throughout. So it's something that I love. Like I love teaching and I love food and that's what Preppy Kitchen is. It's just helping people understand that being in the kitchen can be fun, that you can do anything from like a simple mashed potato dish to a complicated French macaron. And you can have fun in the process and I can help you take the stress out. That's why it's called Preppy Kitchen. It's taking a sense of preparedness into the kitchen. A lot of people think, I love food, I love eating, but I can't make it. Or I'm a great person on the barbecue, but I can't do any baking or vice versa. And I'm here to tell you that's not true. Everyone can do it. And what's more, you can have fun doing it and really have a sense of satisfaction and enjoy, enjoy in your learning and experimentation. And that's what I wanted to bring to the book. The book kind of takes everything we've talked about, like moving to Connecticut, experiencing and loving the seasons and learning how to make new things. So the book's arranged by the season because, as we know, I keep thinking about summer. Like there's a willow tree right out the window where we have these picnics at. I'd serve like angel food cake and like fruit salad and we make sandwiches or whatever else. Like I'd grill some salmon with charred oranges and fennel. That's something I crave during the summer. But in the winter, I don't want any of that, to be honest. <laughs> don't give me some grilled salmon right now. I want to have like something like stewing on the stove. I want to like have all the smells throughout the day. Something slow cooked, really warming and hearty, richer. That's just how I feel because it's a very blue, gray, cold and wet day. And that's what would make me happy. So the books are arranged not only by what you can get in the market and have like nice fresh ingredients at their peak, but also like what you feel like eating. I 
could go for some short ribs right now. That sounds delicious. Yeah, exactly. That's a great <laughs> idea. I love the story about how you've had past students see you, you know, on the book tour or you know, even seeing you on YouTube. That's got to be a pretty cool thing, man, to be a teacher for so long. Then you have them come up to you being like, oh, my God. It's really cool. And I still have like so many parents who I talk to on Instagram. I love like replying to comments and you know, on YouTube, when I put up a video, I'll have such wonderful things written by people. So they'll say like, my grandmother makes a similar cookie, but she has this, this, and this. And like, this is one of her favorite dishes. Right. I've had people tell me that they're like trying to recreate a family recipe from someone that passed away and like, oh, this is actually really close to that. So like, thank you so much. And like, I'm going to add this spice and this spice. And I love these stories because food isn't just about love. It's not just about nourishment. It's really about family histories and what are the things that we've celebrated with. So like one of the, my favorite moments growing up was like going through my grandmother's cookbooks and my mom's cookbooks that she'd collected in the scrapbooks of all the recipes that they had, you know, gathered from magazines and these yellowed clippings and seeing like what, what were like the special notes my grandmother wrote in her, her beautiful handwriting. And we got to make these recipes again and kind of experience that moment. You have a pretty rich culinary heritage. Can you talk about some of the ways your parents' influence shows up in the cooking you do now? Yeah. I mean, my mom's, like I said, my mom's from Mexico and my dad was Greek and French Canadian. So you have some really cool cultures coming together and lovely flavor profiles. So like in the book, you'll see some Latin inspired recipes, but you'll see some of my, just I took this as a moment to like compile all my favorite things. So we have a lot of little ones at home right now who are probably feeling a bit under the weather and you're looking for something that can like just be that magical thing in a bowl. And for me, that was avocado lemono, which is a Greek lemon chicken soup. It's white because you have meringue folded into it, which sounds oh. so weird, but it creates this rich, creamy, velvety soup with these wonderful notes of lemon and there's fresh oregano and then there's rice and chicken. It's like so hearty and nourishing and it's always like the medicine in a bowl that I craved. So I was so happy to, to share that. When I was growing up, we had like Sunday dinners every night at my grandparents' house and there was a friendly competition between like my mom and my grandmother, especially on desserts and specifically on pie crusts. So when it was like pie making season, they were always like going for who could have like the most crisp flaky crust. And my mom was at a bit of a disadvantage because she did not use any shortening. She's a butter pie crust person, which <laughs> I know it's like, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing with shortening in the pie crust, but those are like the memories that I grew up with. So there was always like a sense of just like trying new things and like seeing like, what would people enjoy? What do I want to play with? Like, what can I get at the market right now? What are some of the recipes in the book that you think people would really love to make right now? There was something in the fall chapter about a chicken pot roast and oh looks gosh. like the kind of thing that you would just dive into on a rainy, rainy cold day like this. So can you tell us a little bit about how that recipe came together? A roasted chicken was like one of our favorite Sunday meals. You know, it was, it was that or like a big roasted leg of lamb. And I wanted to take some of the Greek flavors that I love, but make it kind of an easy just roast in the pot, set it and forget it kind of meal. So I made sure to have the olives in there and you have like wonderful flavors and herbs coming in. But a lot of people get intimidated when they want to roast a whole bird. But it's one of the easiest things ever. It really just comes down to timing it and preparing it. And there's so many different ways to prepare it. You can add herbs that you love. But I think of that roast as just like an easy way to like, just get started. Yeah try it out. And there's like, you know, you can add anything into it. You, I love adding potatoes in there. I love adding onions in there. You can have roasted carrots. It's my Sunday meal that we have every Sunday here because it's so easy. <laughs> it's just like on the weekend, you want to do fun things with your family and you don't necessarily want to be laboring over something really complicated. Sometimes you do because it's like a fun activity to have with everybody else. But this is that recipe where you can just kind of assemble it all. You pop it in and then when you pull it out, you have an almost complete meal. I would like that right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, yeah. And roast chicken. Listen, that's a great dish as well, but this sounds like a more delicious, fun, nice twist on it. But yeah, there's so many different ways to dress it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Talk about dessert a little bit. And listeners, if you've got a jar of those wonderful high end Luxardo cherries around for garnishing cocktails, I want you to hold on to them because this boozy, delicious yes. chocolate cardamom pot de creme that he makes is perfect for Valentine's Day. And John, I get this is like a grown-up chocolate pudding. It's like a grown-up chocolate pudding, but it's even easier than chocolate pudding because a lot of people, you know, you're taking a pudding onto the stove. There's a couple things you have to worry about. The temperature should be like pretty much just right, even though you can eyeball it. 
But this put a creme is it's beyond easy. It's as easy as flan, which is just like whisking things together, pouring it into a pot and you bake it. So it's something you can make in just a few minutes and it has a rich velvety chocolate texture. And I love cardamom. You'll find it coming in through different recipes, but the combination of the cardamom and the chocolate with that creamy texture, it's a wonderful combination. And of course we have like a little cardamom whipped cream and I love those Luxardo cherries. They give me life. Oh, so they're the best. I love to like pop one into an old fashioned with like a little bit of the juice. You know, that's great. So I took that vibe and we have a boozy Luxardo cherry. So you can either do a quick soak or if you want, like a lot of us have that like half empty thing of cherries, add some bourbon to it and let them soak and really marinate. John, the problem I have is my teenage girls found Luxardo cherries. Oh, no. And now they keep wanting to make their uh, Shirley Temples with it. I'm like, guys, seriously, that's like an $8 <laughs> Shirley right. Temple you just made now. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're looking for like the bulk sale yeah. of them. Like sometimes you need like those really big ones and like it's worth the investment because they are so good. They last forever. <laughs> One of the things I love the most about your recipes, too, is that you do kind of chef it up. You do a lot of weights. You'll put, oh, it's two cups, but it's actually this amount of grams, which is the more accurate way to do it. And I think that's really helpful to people. And I highly recommend everyone get a little gram scale from a store and just do it that way. It's so much easier. One, you have less dishes because all those measuring cups get dirty. You have to wash them and it's kind of annoying. So if you use a scale, everything's just getting poured into a bowl. No muss, no fuss. And then so many people think, oh, I'm not a good baker, and they're following the recipe to a T, but they're doing a couple things that to sabotage their own recipe they don't know about. So like if you're measuring a flour out, and flour is the main one here. I'm getting so excited right now. Tell them, John, I'm getting so excited. And you're just scooping the flour out into your measuring cup and leveling it off. You're going to add like 60 to 70% more flour in there, and that's giving you a totally different recipe. And your baked good is going to be drier, breadier, less melt in your mouth, less moist, and less soft. All those things are happening because you're packing flour in. If you want to use a cup, and I understand some of us have like beautiful cups we want to use, it's a memory, that's fine. But here's what you have to do. Fluff your flour up inside the package, sprinkle it in. After you finish sprinkling it in, you level it off with a knife, and then you're going to be accurate. Maybe you'll only be seven grams off per cup. Or you could just dump it into a bowl, it'll be accurate, and you'll have wonderful results every time. And all of a sudden, you think, oh my gosh, I'm the best baker in the world. I'm doing everything right. <laughs> These recipes are finally working for me. Leanne, do you have a scale? Highly recommend you get a scale if you don't have one. No, but I think I'm not a great baker, and I feel is. like I need to take John's John's <laughs> advice, and maybe that's why my baking doesn't come out great, because I don't yeah. have a scale. So that's that's a goal for next year. Or tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, tomorrow. Perfectly. We want to let our listeners know that aside from the recipes for really beautiful food for every season, each chapter also includes some special projects, something to cook and something that'll get you outside to enjoy, you know, the natural beauty of our little state. John, we just have one more question for you. And this is the most important question. I'm ready. Can we come over and play with the goats? (laughs) Yes. Come on over. (laughs) John, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. I love talking about food and it was a pleasure. That was John Cannell. His debut cookbook is Preppy Kitchen, Recipes for Seasonal Dishes and Simple Pleasures. We have recipe excerpts on our site for John's Greek lemon chicken soup, the chicken pot roast, and that lovely pot creme. Find them at ctpublic.org slash recipes. I'm Leanne Griffin. The easiest way to find my recent work is to go to ctpost.com and search my name, L-E-E-A-N-N-E-G-R-I-F-F-I-N. And find me on Twitter. I'm at LGriffinCT. Leanne, thank you for joining me this month. And on behalf of all of my restaurant chef friends and everybody who loves food, thanks for all the work you do to make sure people know about the great places to eat in the state, whether they've been around for years or they just open their doors. Thank you so much. I've had so much fun being part of this project and learning a lot more about these new places that I haven't been to yet. It's been fun, right? A lot of fun. I mean, the Grizz was awesome. The Grizz is a really cool place. Everyone needs to go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm Chef Plum. Season is produced by Robin Doyanagan, Katie Tolarski, Catrice Claudio, and Emily Cherish. Special thanks to Emily for producing most of the restaurant stories in this episode. Listen to Seasoned on Connecticut Public the first Thursday of every month or get new episodes delivered to your inbox even sooner by signing up for our newsletter, Full Plate. For all the info, go to ctpublic.org slash food. To keep up with the latest on Seasoned, follow at ctpublic on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And we're at WNPR on Twitter or follow the hashtag SeasonedCT on all platforms. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you right back here next month.